I um, am Sarah from the Bay County Public Library, and it is September, which is Library Card Sign Up Month. And we thought it would be really fun if we could do a partnership with the Extension Office and do a From Seed to Salad Kits and then do a program featuring the seeds that are in the Seed to Salad Kits. So right now we have at all of the Bay County uh, uh, lo Library locations, Parker, Panama City Beach, and Bay County Public Library, there's kits with five different seeds, arugula, kale, carrots, um, radishes, and lettuce. And there's about eight to 10 seeds in each packet. And all you have to do is go to the front desk and say, I would like a seed salad kit and you need your library card and they'll they'll give you one for as long as su supplies last. But right now we're doing good. So it's a great week to come in. September, library card sign up month. Library cards are free for all residents of Bay Golf and Liberty County. All you need is a photo ID and proof of residency. So if you have an ID that's not a local ID, but you have like a lease or a bill, you can bring that in and you'll get your library card where you can check out 20 items at a time. And we have way more than just books. We've got audio books, we've got musical instruments, including ukuleles, we've got databases, we've got cake pans and even telescopes. So I'm going to pass this over to Julie and Melanie from the Extension Office and we'll begin the Seed to Salad program. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We're really excited to be part of this program today. So I'm gonna start out and talk about um, how to grow the seeds that are in your kit. So um, like Sarah said, we're really excited to partner together on this project. Uh, we definitely try to support each other in each other's programs. She's been a really great member of our advisory committee council for the extension office and always comes up with some great ideas. So as far as University of Florida IFAS extension, what we do, we teach and we teach research based information and we have extension offices in all 67 counties of the state. And the way that we teach are through classes, workshops, uh, field days, traditional media, webinars, social media, and one-on-one -on -one consultations. So every ex county extension office is comprised of subject matter experts and it's geared towards what the needs of that particular community um, are. And so for Bay County, we have horticulture, which is me, Julie McConnell, and we have family and consumer sciences, which is Melanie Taylor, who you will be hearing from later today. And we also have Florida Sea Grant or Marine Science and 4-H Youth Development, which also has a lot of volunteer development in that program too. So in your From Sea to Salad kit, this is what you're going to see. You get this nice little uh, brown paper bag, like a you know little lunch and learn like we want to do today. And it has inside of it five different packets of seeds. And those seeds are lettuce, kale, carrots, radish, and arugula. It has um, information on how to grow those seeds and also recipes and nutritional information. And I will tell you, when you go to open up each little seed packet, the seeds inside are very, very small. So just make sure you kind of shake them down at the bottom before you open the flap. And then there is also a little piece of paper inside with some um, instructions for that individual type of seed. So make sure when you pull it out that you don't spill the seeds everywhere. So fair warning, um, it was a very delicate process. And of course we could not have done it without our volunteers. We had two amazing groups of volunteers help with this effort. The University of Florida IFAS Extension Bay County Master Gardeners. They created the handouts, the inserts, they sorted those teeny little seeds and packaged them up for you. And then your Bay County Public Library volunteers took those seed packets and those papers and they put everything together in those beautiful brown bags with the ribbon and they're hand tied with love. So please, just if you know one of those volunteers, give them a big thank you because without them, this would not have happened. So vegetable gardening basics. I'm going to just talk about some really basic stuff because we have an hour and we've got a lot of material to cover. So I want you to think about where to plant because that's really important. Right plant, right place is our number one Florida friendly landscaping principle. I'm gonna give you some basic maintenance guidelines and then tell you about the plants that are in your packet. So site selection, vegetables need five to six hours of direct sunlight a day. Um, it's a good idea to put them near your house or a water source just because they are going to need water if we don't get adequate rainfall. And if it's too far away or inconvenient, you won't do it, okay? Uh, also, if you're planting in the ground, you need well-drained soil. I think we all can look around our yards and figure out what areas maybe are not appropriate for vegetables. Avoid tree roots, avoid wet soils, um, and avoid septic lines if you're on septic. And if you don't have a perfect site, 
it's really easy to grow vegetables in containers, especially these fall garden varieties because they are very small and they don't take a lot of space. So if you are going to garden in the native soil, there are some things you want to think about. Uh, it's a good idea to have a soil test done to check for the pH. That's the most important information. The ideal pH range for vegetables is from 5.8 to 6.5. If you um, have a soil test done through um, our lab at the University of Florida or through a private lab, they will give you recommendations on how much lime or sulfur to add if it's needed. Never add lime or sulfur to a garden or to your landscape without having a soil test that tells you that you actually need it and how much you need. You need to be especially careful with sulfur because too much is toxic to plants. So when you're preparing that garden area, you're going to want to clear out any type of debris. And of course, you'll till the soil, you'll remove any, any weeds or other vegetation, sticks, rocks, roots, all that. You want to start with a, a smooth area that you can work in well. It's a good idea to add some organic matter um, or to your soil because our soils tend to be very, very sandy and they don't have uh, much nutritive value and they tend to not hold water very well, not including when we get 25 inches of rain in a month or however much we had, it feels like that. Um, and it, it also just kind of gives a better soil life environment. You need those microbes and earthworms and those other critters in your soil to, um, to help keep it aerated too. So if you're not going to do in the ground, um, then you can always do containers. You could do raised beds also, but I'm going to just kind of keep it simple and just mention container gardening. So as far as containers go, you can use just about anything. The most important thing is that they have drainage holes because we don't want saturated soils, whether in the ground or in a container. Um, you really just need to think about what size is the plant I'm going to grow? Do I have enough room for the roots? And with, with these plants, the, uh, the seeds that we're providing right now, they don't, they don't need a lot of space. So you could use a lot of different items for container gardening. Um, commercial potting mix is an easy way to start. Just purchase this at um, any garden center or home improvement store. And the benefit of doing a commercial pot potting mix is that it's lightweight and it's made specifically for container gardening. Um, it'll have good drainage. It tends to be lighter. It's actually kind of a soilless media and it's gonna, going to be weed and pathogen free. So that's really important. Now it can be expensive though, and especially if you have large containers. So if you would prefer to make it yourself, you have a lot of containers or they're very big, it may be um, better, more cost effective to mix it yourself. And if you do, then the recommendation is one third compost. And this needs to be composted material. It needs to have reached the heat so that it kills the weed and pathogen seeds if you're composting it yourself or you can purchase compost. Um, one third peat and one third vermiculite. That's just kind of a standard mix that you can use in containers. Because we're, we're, we know we're giving you seeds, so we're not gonna talk about transplants today. Instead, we're just going to talk about seed germination. You definitely have to have good moisture when you're trying to grow from seed because that seed needs to stay moist until it, it, the, the seedling erupts from the seed case. But you don't want it to be waterlogged because one of the problems that we tend to see is we can get some fungal diseases and have what we call damping off where it just dies. So again, make sure you've got good drainage. Um, I'm growing some seeds in containers where I'm doing undercover right now because really we've had so much rain, it would have been a real challenge to keep them from getting flooded. Um, so that's something to consider. Maybe we'll dry out a little bit more. The temperature range for seeds is minimum 50 degrees Fahrenheit, maximum 70 to 80 degrees. We're going to be, these are cool season plants that we're doing. So we're gonna be on the lower range and it's, it's gonna be about perfect as we start cooling off at night and you have to have oxygen. That's why I keep saying you don't want waterlogged soils. You don't want flooded areas. Um, another thing you want to avoid is compacted soils. You've gotta have some oxygen available for um, good uh, seed germination and root development. So in these seed package, you have roughly 10 to 15 seeds, depending on which one they are. So if you're careful when you take them out, you should be able to, to spread them out where you don't have to do any thinning. But if you're growing some other seeds and you, you are a little heavy handed when you plant them or you do with these, you may need to thin them out. And 
If you pull them to thin them, it can be disruptive to the ones you leave. So sometimes it's a good idea to just cut the little plant off. Um, and that way you've got enough space in there for the ones that you leave to develop fully, especially when you're talking about carrots with your, your root vegetable, because it does need space underground to get your actual vegetable you're going to eat. So when we water the garden, again, I mentioned that it's important to keep those new seeds moist, but then you need to back off. You can do too much. Um, there, you definitely want to make sure that you're only watering the plants as, as needed. Um, less water is needed during the cool season. So again, it's not gonna be as high maintenance to garden at this time of year as it would be in the spring or the summer. If you can avoid getting water on the foliage, that's really helpful because most of the diseases that we see in plants is, are fungal based and they need moisture. So we're always gonna have that dew or that moisture overnight. We have a high humidity. So if we're watering the leaves of the plant instead of the soil zone, then it just kind of favors the, um, the incidence of disease development. So try to keep the leaves as dry as possible. Soaker hoses or triple or, or drip irrigation work pretty well. If you can do that, if you just have a small garden, it may not be worth the investment. Usually we can hand water a small area and just be conscious of not soaking the leaves. So the vegetables are going to need some fertilizer to develop well. Um, there are synthetic or there are organic types and your synthetics are usually have a pretty wide variety and that's just basically the, you know, the bags that you see at the store and they'll have their uh, fertilizer analysis on the front and you can get slow release or you can get quick release. Um, organic, same, you can still buy them in the store or some people will just supplement with compost or um, uh, some other products that are generally incorporated in. A lot of your organic products need to break down, which means they're just naturally a slow release product. Um, but no matter what type of fertilizer you use, make sure that you are following the instructions on the bag and not over fertilizing. Um, you want to um, make sure that you're not overdoing it, especially when we're doing vegetable crops that have fruit, like the summer uh, vegetables like tomatoes and peppers. If you do too much fertilization, sometimes you have a great big plant with no fruit on it. With the leafy ones, it's, it's not as, as easy to do that, but again, you always wanna follow the directions. Some of our methods are side dressing, broadcast fertilization, or incorporating pre-plant and top dressing. So this shows you what we mean by, um, well, broadcast is when you basically put it out over the whole area. Um, another thing is you can do the, um, the banded furrows. So say you have the seed in the middle and then you do the furrows on either side of it. And you know, what you're, what you're, if you're thinking on that is that the plants will grow roots that will grow out laterally. And so you make that fertilizer available in that region of soil where you expect the roots to expand. And with us in, in Florida, you know, whether you're doing a container garden or you're doing in ground, you know, it's always better to err um, on the lighter side with fertilizer applications and do uh, maybe slightly more frequent, but at the lowest rate or even a little bit lower than the recommended rate. You can always increase it, but if you do too much, you can burn the plants. So weed control. Um, you want to make sure that you are keeping the weeds under control because they will not only take up space in your garden, but they will compete for um, water and nutrients with your, your plants you're trying to grow. Sometimes they also can be alternate hosts for disease or insects that can impact your garden. So it's, it's really important to try to get a handle on the weeds. And if you're growing in the ground, of course, you want to take care of that before you plant and then, you know, just watch it. Um, pull the weeds as you go. And um, if you have a season where you're not using your garden, then you want to try to keep the weeds under control during that time also, because if not, then they can really get out of hand. Um, a simple thing to do, especially in a small garden, is to just pull by hand. If you have a really large garden, there may be a need to use herbicides, but you want to be really, really careful because you obviously don't want to, to um, accidentally um, get it on the plants that you're trying to keep alive because you'll kill them. Another thing is if you are composting at home, you may want to avoid including any of those heavy seeding uh, weeds because even though you are supposed to let your compost pile get hot enough to kill seeds and to kill pathogens, sometimes it doesn't. And if you're just adding seeds to the mix, then it could be just incorporating it back into your garden. Okay. Also the areas around your garden. If you have a lot of uh, weedy areas where there are seeds that can potentially very easily blow into 
the garden, then it's it's just basically seeding the garden with with unwanted plants. Um, mulch is a good idea too, and there are a lot of products that you could use um, to mulch. And um, you could use straw or wood chips or just commercial mulch that's already ready. So some of the benefits of mulching is, of course, it suppresses weed growth, but it will also help conserve moisture and regulate the soil temperature. It protects the roots. And if you have an area that might be prone to erosion, that helps kind of reduce that. Also, if you use a, um, a natural material like straw or wood chips, then as it breaks down, it's adding organic matter to your soil too. So a lot of, lot of benefits to doing that. Okay, I know I'm going fast. We're gonna provide some supplemental um, information for everybody. So, um, and this is recorded, so don't panic if I'm, I'm running through here quickly. Um, but I wanna give Melanie enough time to talk about preparing these foods and nutrition and leave time for questions. So I'm going to just cover quickly the five seed varieties that are in your From Seed to Salad kit. And the first one is Buttercrunch Lettuce. And so the planting dates are September to October, which of course we made sure to pick plants that were appropriate to plant at this time of year. We don't want to give you something you got to wait until next spring because you might forget or lose it. So the lettuce usually comes up pretty quickly, germinates in seven to 10 days. So you'll start to see that little baby seedling coming up, but it takes about 50 to 60 days to harvest. Um, when you go to harvest it, you can, you, there's two different methods. If you want to, you can just take a couple of leaves from the outer part of the plant and if you do that, it'll keep creating new leaves. And so you can just kind of get a little bit at a time and keep enjoying it. Another thing you could do is let it get a full head and then go ahead and cut the whole head off. And it typically won't grow back after that. So either method is fine. Um, these seeds are very, very small. So they don't have a very deep planting depth. An eighth of an inch is an estimate, but kind of just barely cover them with soil and that will um, be enough that it can hold the moisture and they can, can germinate. Um, you wanna put them about eight to 12 inches apart so that you don't have to thin, and then that way it has enough space to create the head. Scarlet kale is another one, and this is really, it's kind of pretty too. Even if you don't like the way kale tastes, this is a really lovely plant. Um, September to February, so you can space this out a little bit more. If you wanna plant a couple now and then wait, you can do that. Um, it only takes about four to 10 days for those seeds to germinate, but it takes about 70 to 80 days um, before you can harvest. Planting as late as February would be okay, but if we get really, really hot in March, then it does affect the taste of these cool season plants. So you might not wanna wait quite that long. Um, again, you can cut individual leaves. This is not going to form a head, so you would always be just cutting individual leaves off of kale. But again, you can either just take them a little bit at a time or you can do a bigger harvest. If you leave them, they tend to regrow some of the leaves. This seed is still small, a little bit bigger than the lettuce, so maybe a half an inch, but very shallow planted. 12 to 18 inches gives enough room for growth that you shouldn't have to thin. This is a really neat one. Sarah picked out some really cool vegetables. So deep purple carrots. These carrots are purple. And of course we can plant them from September to March. And it takes about seven to 21 days to germinate. I planted some a couple of weeks ago and they came up. Now with this one, you wanna kind of notice that when the seedling comes up, it doesn't look like other ones. It looks very grassy. So don't, don't be fooled into thinking that you have some weeds coming up. The, all your other ones are gonna come up little round leaves and have a real generic look to them, but the carrots look like little grassy seeds. 70 to 80 days to harvest. Uh, again, small seeds, half to quarter, or I'm sorry, a quarter to half inch depth. Um, space them two to three inches apart. Yeah, you could probably even go a little, probably more towards the three inch to give them um, enough space. Uh, direct seeding only, and that means basically carrots don't transplant well. So some of your other ones you could start in like a little jiffy pot type thing or in a small container and move it. Carrots don't like to be moved. So um, I would just direct seed with these. Astro arugula. So this one again, September to March. Um, arugula has kind of a peppery taste, it has a little more flavor than some of your other greens, which I'm sure Melanie's going to talk about. So five to seven days to germination, uh, 20 to 40 days to harvest. So this one's going to turn around pretty quickly and you can cut individual leaves. Again, this is not going to head up like cabbage or lettuce 
and uh, only about an eighth of an inch um, planting depth and 12 to 18 inches apart to give them enough space to grow. And our last one is Easter egg radish. And these radishes are great. I love to, if I'm introducing kids to gardening, radishes are like the perfect winter vegetable because they come up really, really quickly. So three to seven days for germination, and then you can harvest in 20 to 30 days. So a month or less, depending on the conditions. Um, a half to, or a quarter to a half inch deep and one to two inches apart. It's really fun to kind of stagger plant these also because, you know, then you can harvest them and have some more coming on. So some upcoming events that we have on the gardening front is uh, we do a, a live webinar once a month called Gardening in the Panhandle Live. And it runs through Zoom and Facebook, just like this format here. And our uh, next one is going to be next week with beginning beekeeping. And this is a panel of experts who answer your questions that you can submit when you register through Zoom. And I am going to um, put out a bunch of links in the chat when I stop talking, when Melanie starts and um, let you know about how you can find out more about those programs. All right, so I'm Melanie Taylor, and I'm the Family and Consumer Science Agent for Bay County, and we're going to talk about how to take some of those vegetables that you're going to grow this fall um, and what to do with them, how to cook them, how to prepare them, um, maybe how to preserve them, depending on what it is and what you want to do. So I am going to share my screen here. Hold on just a second. I cannot get it out of preview or out of that mode, so I'm going to have to stick with it. Sorry, folks. All right, so first of all, let's talk fall vegetables. So you see, we're gonna get the from seed to salad packet. Um, and of course there's gonna be vegetables in here that I'm gonna mention are not part of that. Um, and that is just because um, there's plenty of vegetables beyond the, the five that you, you can grow from this packet. But what we're gonna talk about is one of the problems people have is sometimes they get those, um, those uh, vegetables growing and then all of a sudden, they don't know what to do with all of it. And sometimes it comes in abundance. So are you gonna cook it? Are you gonna preserve it? You wanna freeze it? You wanna give it to your friends? Um, so we wanna make sure you get to enjoy whatever it is that you're cooking and that you've grown. So make sure you kind of prepare for that. Um, so we're gonna talk about some ways to do that. Um, one thing you're gonna get with your packet is this informational sheet here. It'll give you the nutritional importance of each of the vegetables that you're gonna be growing. Um, and then a, one recipe per, one healthy recipe per vegetable. So um, those are, and I chose ones that were healthy, but I also chose ones that are fairly easy to make. So you could even do them with children if you have them. Um, easy to make at home, um, doesn't have a lot of odd ingredients in them. So you should be able to do these with, with pretty much what you already have if you have basic kitchen supplies. And I tried to pick a few that were a little bit different than usual, just so that we could, you could try some different um, flavors, um, some crunchy, some sweet, that kind of thing. Um, so let's talk about cooking. So first of all, um, if you're an experienced cooker, this may not even pertain to you, but how to season your vegetables. And a lot of people just say, I don't know what to do and I don't have a recipe. So what you just start with the basics, if you don't know, just basically taking any kind of vegetable, especially the harder vegetables and just seasoning them with salt, pepper, and garlic. And that's pretty much it. And then seasoning them to your taste and cooking them to the level that you want to eat them, whether you want them crispy or a little bit softer. Um, and then once you've done the basics with garlic, then you might want to explore a little bit, add about a tablespoon of olive oil or butter, depending which one you prefer to cook with. Try other oils if you prefer. Season the vegetables with salt and pepper and garlic to taste. And then if you want to leave out the garlic, add in any kind of herbs and seasonings that you like. Um, and experiment with it. If you find one you don't like or you overdo it um, with that spice, then just keep trying and trying different ones. Try fresh ones, um, try dried ones, all kinds of things. And you might find a new seasoning or an herb out there that you like um, that you didn't know about before. Um, I always say when you are trying new seasonings and new herbs, always um, err on the lighter side of seasoning it than on the heavier side. You can always add more seasoning and more herbs, but you can't take them out. And sometimes we can overwhelm ourselves. Um, I have overwhelmed our meals before with rosemary. So, um, and that can be a very strong one. So just being aware of that, um, as, especially if you're new at cooking with, at trying to cook your own vegetables and season them. 
One of the things we enjoy in the fall are the root vegetables, and you're going to get some of those from your seed kit, um, particularly the carrots and um, the radishes. Um, so root vegetables basically are you're eating the edible root that's an extension of that vegetable and it grows underground. Um, they're generally highly nutritious, low in calories, basically have little to no fat. Um, many root vegetables are commonly eaten raw. A lot of us have probably never had a cooked radish, but you can always um, roast them or um, steam them any way you want to. So you can do whatever you want. We don't have to stick with that normal, just adding it into a salad. Um, root vegetables can generally be stored a little longer than some of our leafier vegetables. They're a little bit sturdier. You can usually keep them uh, for several weeks, depending on how high quality it is versus the ones that um, we have to eat within a couple of days. Um, some examples are carrots and radishes, which you're gonna have in your kit, and then some beets, um, kohlrabi, parsnip, rutabagas, turnips, and of course there's plenty of more. Those were just a few of the basics that we probably, most of us probably already know about, excuse me. All right. Um, another thing we talk about when we talk about um, cool season or fall season vegetables are leafy greens. Some examples are kale, like you're gonna get in your kit, collard greens, spinaches, cabbages, beet greens, watercress, romaine lettuce, and just about all of these, I know someone that will eat them, if not all of them. Um, basics for cooking these, I know we, a lot of us have a lot of family recipes that we like with our leafy greens, so you're gonna choose your seasonings of your choice, but basically you're gonna just um, cover the pan, put them in water, and then you're gonna cook them until they're tender. It will take about eight to 10 minutes for chard and beet greens. Kale, mustard, turnips, and collard greens do take longer, um, generally 15 to 20 minutes. One thing you're going to see with the kale recipe is that they want you to soak the kale a little bit before you actually cook it, and that's to help soften it up. I know that's one of the complaints a lot of people have when they eat kale is that um, uh, it's a little too crunchy even after they cooked it, um, or it can be a little strong. Um, and then, of course, season it to taste however you like. Um, drain the greens well in your colander and then remove any excess liquid and move forward with whatever recipe it is you've chosen. So those are just basic ways to get those items prepared for cooking. So moving on, once you have an abundance of items is what can you do with them? Hopefully you're gonna cook as many as you can and share them with your family and friends. But if you have an abundance and you do want to try and preserve them, we definitely can help you do that. Um, one of those ways is by canning. If you do have um, the materials for canning, you can do pressure canning and water bath canning. Um, we do have classes here that we do offer um, for canning basics where you can learn that if you haven't done it before. I do highly recommend that if you're gonna try it on your own or if you've done it before and you just wanna refresh yourself, make sure you visit the um, USDA website for canning and make sure that you're using properly FDA approved um, recipes and a pressure cooker that hasn't been sitting in the cabinet for 30 years, that kind of thing. And we can actually test that here and make sure that that gauge is still good for you and working properly. So just, just remember there is a safety um, concern behind, behind canning if you don't know how to do it. Um, we do have um, online resources I'm gonna share with you at the end of this that will take you straight to those links and we'll give you recipes for canning that are safe and um, pretty easy to do in your home. If you aren't big on canning yet, there is a difference. Water bath canning is going to um, be done basically like this. Those are some tomatoes that we actually canned a few years ago. And um, this is a water bath um, canner here. And then over here with the person in the picture is a pressure canner. Um, we did some meats with the pressure canner. Um, some people, most people find the water canning, um, the water bath canning much easier. Um, and they are not as concerned as with a pressure canner. There's a little bit more that you need to know when it comes to the pressure canning side of things. And we're not gonna go into those details today. Um, one of the things we can do with our vegetables is definitely freeze them. If you don't have one of these um, machines here that will take the air out for you, you can just make sure that your vegetables are dry before you put them in there. Um, Cause you do wanna wash them, but you wanna dry them off. And then use uh, Ziploc bags of some sort that you're going to get the air completely out of. If you don't have one of these machines to actually pull that air out for you, you can do it yourself and just make sure they're sealed well. Um, I highly recommend that you put what is in it um, with a Sharpie, write it on the outside, put the date of when you did it. 
um, because six months from now, when you look at it, you may not recognize it because it's so frozen and you want to know how long it's been in there. You don't want to leave it in there for long, too long a period because it will just be frostbitten. So those are some easy ways to freeze. Freezing to me is probably one of, is the easiest way to actually preserve some of these fruits and vegetables that we have from our summer and fall gardens. And I prefer it. I think that, um, you know, basically freezing does keep that um, moisture out. It keeps them dry. It keeps the flavor. It also um, saves the nutritional value in it. And so when you start using it, maybe in the winter time, um, for example, then it'll be ready for you to use and it'll taste just like it came out of the garden. This is an interesting app. Um, it is through USDA. If you ever or, um, find yourself asking, should I leave this in the fridge? Should I eat it? Should I throw it out? Has it been in here too long? Um, this is a free food keeper app where you can pull up any kind of food that you have, whether it's fresh or um, something you got from the grocery store, and you could see how long in general you're supposed to keep it and whether or not you need to make that decision to get rid of it. You just want to err on the side of caution. Um, I know a lot of us will smell things and say, oh, it smells okay. So, or it looks okay. So let's go ahead and cook with it, but you don't want to um, make anybody sick for sure. So that's a free food keeper app and you just type in what it is you're looking for, consider how long it's been in your refrigerator or freezer, and then you should know if it's safe for you to eat or um, need to throw out. Um, the next one is drying our foods. A lot of us do like to use a dehydrator of our own, especially with fruits. I know that's pretty common. Um, you can see up here in the top right hand corner, we've basically made our, um, it's called fruit licorice or fruit roll up. That's what I call them. But this is basically making your own fruit roll up in the dehydrator. And then of course, we are talking about kale today as one of the specifics. Um, a lot of people right now like to make their own kale chips where they put them into the oven. They roast them for a short period of time gets all the moisture out of them, they get crispy. Most people do um, sprinkle them ahead of time with salt, um, pepper, sometimes garlic. It all depends on what it is that you like. So you don't even need a dehydrator like for here with the fruits. You do not need this de a dehydrator for these. You can do these right in the oven, put them out, spread them out on a cookie sheet, put them in there. It depends on your oven, maybe 15 to 20 minutes to help dry them out. And if you are trying different ways to try and eat kale or find out if you do like the kale, that's another way that you can make your own kale chips and see if you like that. Um, next, there are definitely ways to ferment and pickle your foods. Um, obviously cucumbers are a summer vegetable, but I didn't want to leave it out because it is a way to preserve your vegetables if you want to, or, or cucumbers if you want to. And then of course we have jam and jelly making, typically with fruits, but people do, um, like to make some types of pepper jellies and jams. So that is another option. I will have the link in just a few minutes for you to um, go in and look at the different methods for uh, preserving your foods if you're interested. Are there any questions so far? I haven't been checking the chat box. So if anybody has a question. We've got um, one question. Okay. If greens are cooked longer, does it take away from the nutrients? Um, if you were to cook them to, to, yes, if you cook them too much, it does take some of the nutrients away. Um, basically, you're just going to boil the heck out of them. <laughs> um, so just being aware of that. But I also understand that a lot of people won't eat them if they're too hard um, and not cooked enough and you, and you want to enjoy them. Um, just remembering, too, that I'm not, um, I am from the South, too. I'm not a huge um, eater of greens just because of, it's not in my, not something that I find tasty, but I have found ones that I'll eat over others. Remembering your salt intake as far as your health and nutrition, because a lot of people do like to put a lot of salty meats into them that can suddenly take a lot or add a lot of fat and salt. And if you're trying to manage that in your diet, then you might want to do some alternative seasonings in those, uh, in the greens. And then we have um, a question about your classes um, okay. on, on how can you get on the list for for your classes? Well, uh, we're gonna ask you for um, a survey at the end of this. And definitely if you wanna be added to our email list, let us know that. Um, I do wanna share while I'm, while I'm here, cause I know Julie shared some of her classes for the family and consumer science programs for the whole part of Northwest Florida. We're gonna be having a festive feast, healthy table virtual cooking class that's gonna start in September. And if you register by September 14th, you will get a 25% off discount. So it only makes it 14 dollars 
Um, the link is here. I will also put the link into the chat box in just a moment. Um, it's also on our Facebook page and, and I'll be sharing that on my personal Facebook page too, if we're personal friends, because I do see some people on here that I know. And it's going to be a fun class. It's only four sessions. You can do it right from the comfort of your own home. You can have your family members there or friends with you. And there will be some hopefully um, do-it-yourself activities. You'll get all the recipes. You'll be linked into our Facebook page. You'll be linked into a Google document page which is going to provide you with all those recipes and do it yourself um, other do it yourself recipes outside of what we do during the sessions and then we're hoping that you'll participate in some of the cooking live sessions with us and if you have never um, cooked a turkey on your own but you, for Thanksgiving but you've always wondered how to do that our very last session is going to be how to purchase your turkey um, how to uh, thaw your turkey how to prepare your turkey turkey and how to cook it so it's going to be very detailed. So if you need assistance with that or you've never done it, that will definitely be the session, one of the sessions you'll want to attend, but we hope you'll join them all. But um, as you can see here, we're going to focus the first class on fresh Florida fall flavors. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Um, second one will be comfort foods with soups and breads. The third one will be healthier holidays. We're going to focus on things like cranberry sauce and, and other um, things that most of us have at our Thanksgiving. It's pretty traditional and how to maybe make them a little bit healthier, a little less salt, a little less sugar, but plenty of flavor. And then our turkey talk will be the entire session will be from start to finish how to purchase and then prepare and cook your turkey. So that's kind of fun. So that will be available and I'll put that in the link in the chat box in just a minute. Here are some of my resources that I had. And then we have plenty of time for questions. And we have a note coming into the library on Tuesday for a seed package. And I'm pretty sure we'll still have plenty by then. Oh, potatoes. Oh, potatoes. That's a great question. So um, potatoes, you can grow those. Usually your target date for planting is around Valentine's Day. So mid-February is a, a good time to get those in the ground. Um, I've done them both in the ground and in containers. You want to make sure you buy, um, get seed potatoes. Usually they'll have them at some of the different garden centers. I know, I think I got some at um, Tractor Supply last year or the year before. Um, I've seen them at Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart. You know, definitely check with your independent garden centers and see if they have them. Um, feed stores are a great resource too. Yukon Gold does pretty well here. And then there's another one. Um, I think it's Pontiac red and it's not the, it's not the great big baking Idaho type potatoes. It's more of like your new potato varieties that do well in Florida. So um, yeah, they're, it's great because you get them in the ground around Valentine's and by Memorial day, they're ready to harvest. I also, this is totally unrelated to potatoes. Um, <laughs> there's someone on here named Claudia that is out from Lake County. It is perfectly fine that you join us. It is also perfectly fine that you join our online programs. Um, anything like the cooking class or the, um, gardening programs that she was just talking about um you can join any of those anything that has a zoom link it doesn't matter where you're from um, we would love to have you join us okay and i see there's a question about soil testing um we don't have a lab here at our office so we cannot do any soil testing um locally uh, you what you have to do is mail the uh soil sample along with the form and a payment to our soil testing lab in gainesville and it's three dollars if you just want ph and it's ten dollars if you want like a nutrient analysis where they make a, a nutrient recommendation we have the forms here and we have little sample bags but really we can email the form and you can just use like a, a sandwich bag to mail it in yeah and i'd also like to thank you patrick for um I, when i got tongue twisted and i couldn't think of what the fruit roll-ups are called they're called fruit <laughs> leathers i just had a moment <laughs> oh, let's see over-the-counter um soil test kits um, I mean, they're okay. Um, they're not going to give you as detailed um, information as, you know, it, it's a different kind of test basically for just general can give you a ballpark on, on pH, but you know, you kind of, if it's really inexpensive, it's probably really inaccurate. <laughs> so if you're going to do it yourself, you probably have to really invest in a, in a decent pH meter or, um, testing kit. But excellent presentation. I'll share your upcoming class with my clients. So great information. You know, most of our online classes 
typically are not limited, especially, you know, mm -hmm. it, it depends, but if they're not face to face and they're probably not limited to um, any amount. So please share our um, information and we'd love to have any of you join. Oh, here's one question. I've never had success growing beets in Panama oh. City. What am I doing? <laughs> you know, I haven't tried to grow beets. I don't know that one off the top of my head. Um, we'll have to we'll have to check into that. There are some vegetables that just don't do well in our area. I don't know if that's one. It, it might be fantastic. Um, but I will put my email address in the chat. If you want to email me, I can follow up. Oh, and also we have a follow up survey. So um, if you'll take the time to fill that out, we're going to put that link in the chat also, then um, we will, if you provide your email address, we will be drawing names for some prizes. Oh, yeah. I have, I have a vegetable gardening book and Melanie has a few items. Yep. I have a Simply Florida cookbook with all kinds of recipes that was put together by extension agents. And then I have a fresh herb storage container giving away and you can put your herbs and any kind of anything that um is green and fresh that you want to keep fresh a little bit longer we're going to have um you put a little bit of water in the bottom this is glass close the top on it and then you keep it in your fridge um help them extend their freshness a little bit so please make sure you participate in that and send us your email and if you will definitely take the survey, that will help us out a lot. Um, somebody, I do see there's a question in the question and answer section. It says, can I eat kale raw in a salad? And yes, you can. You do want to wash it off. Definitely rinse it um, with cool running water. There's no proof that um, using soap or anything else on them does any, makes any difference. In fact, that would just make it taste worse and could be a problem. Um, definitely cool running water. Get all the dirt and stuff off, especially if it's fresh. But definitely, if you like kale fresh, you can eat it that way in any kind of salad. I've enjoyed kale salads before, yeah. and you can mix it with certain things to kind of sweeten the flavor because it's kind of a, more of a bitter. Right. <laughs> Have you, um, Melanie, used like the uh, electric pressure cookers, like the Instapot or similar? Which I have. have green? Yeah. yeah. That's a pretty I have, and I've had good success with it. Mm -hmm. um, my I don't feel as comfortable with it I haven't done it as much as normal just regular on the stove cooking so I do always follow the recipes the way they are I'm a little afraid to deviate from them mm -hmm. um, whereas if I'm standing at the stove I will add extra things in just for flavoring um, have what I'd like to know just on the chat has anybody does anybody use one of those on a regular basis and have had you had success with it um, we are going to incorporate some of that into our virtual um, cooking class in the fall. Um, so I'm hoping to get more comfortable myself personally with it. Okay, so I see a couple of questions. One about snails and rat lungworm, an issue here. I don't think that that has been an issue here, but there are some different diseases that can be transmitted by snails and slugs. So you really want to avoid handling them. And if you find that you do inadvertently, then make sure you wash with soap and water um, right away. Then collards, yes, collards are a cool season. It's a good time to um, to plant collards also. Um, somebody says that they, with raw kale, it's best if it's massaged with a little bit of olive oil, takes the bitter taste away. And that's what I do typically, because I do think kale is a little bitter. Everybody's taste is a little different. Um, I prefer it that way, yeah. So if you're trying to find different ways, this is a good chance to take some of these vegetables and try new recipes with them figure out new ways to eat them. If you have children, you know, they might not like a raw radish, but if you roast them in the oven with a little bit of seasoning with olive oil, it might be a totally different reaction. So definitely. Um, and the nutritional value of each one of those um, vegetables is on the sheet that's inside of your seed packet. And you can see there what um, kind of nutrition you're gonna be getting and giving your children as they eat those different items. Uh, I cook with an Instapot on a regular basis and love it. That's from Jen. That's great. Fabulous. Somebody says, I remember using kale on salad bars to cover the ice. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it wasn't served as food, but used only for decor. Ha <laughs> ha. And that is true. In the past, that is kind of how it was used, but now it's like considered the superfood <laughs> and everybody wants to try and, and eat it in some way because the nutritional um, value in it is great. The scarlet kale would be really pretty as a garnish. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Somebody says collards are best after the first frost. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that. I've heard that for years. Yeah. 
people prefer yeah. it to frost at a certain time and, and that's when they like to, to eat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it gets too hot, these cool season vegetables, yeah. the flavor starts to change. And if they right. um, start to bolt or throw up a flower, uh, you know, usually like in April or May, then they don't, they taste very different afterwards and get tough. So, yeah. um, we have another question. Can you plant vegetables next to fruit plants? Sure. Sure. I mean, you can plant vegetables really wherever you want to plant them. Um, you know, just kind of, and, and, and I've, I really like to, instead of having like a designated vegetable garden, I will just plant random vegetables in like flower beds. So I have a big area that is full of zinnias and has some other perennials. And so I'll just pop in, I'll have some herbs scattered throughout. And then, you know, I may put a couple of bean plants in the summertime and add in some lettuce or kale. Um, really the biggest thing is making sure that it's the right amount of sunlight and that you have, you know, the right water and, and that type of stuff. So it's, you don't have to designate a vegetable garden. Someone said on here, they use balsamic vinegar in their salads, which is a tiny bit sweet. So she said she's going to try massaging it into that kale also, which I think is a great idea. Balsamic vinegar to me is great on any kind of um, salad. Question yeah. about a rock garden. So I don't know if that means you're mulching with rock or, I mean, you're going, you're going to need to make sure that the the plant, you know, has good contact with the soil and that you're going to be able to water it. Um, now, usually when you put rock down in Florida, you've got weed mat because if you don't, the, the rocks sink into the sand. Um, so if it were me, I would definitely want to make sure that I've got like an area where there's soil and then I can mulch it with something that would break down. I, I'm not real big on weed mat. It's not that you couldn't put it in the rock garden. It might be better to just put a container on top of the rock and then do it in the container. And then you don't have to mess up the other stuff because rock is expensive. I'm not seeing any more questions. I'm seeing more thank yous. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us. Yes, this was fun. A great way to spend our lunch. <laughs> now we're all craving vegetables, right? I know, I kind of want a really nice, refreshing salad. Uh -huh.